All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Liz Henderson's workshop on agricultural justice, creating a fair farm. And we're looking forward to diving into this important topic. But before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over the workshop format for today. I'm Nikki Kolb, NOFA New Hampshire's operations manager, and I'll be moderating this session with fellow NOFA staff members, Chadley Kolb and Laura Andrews. Hi. We're asking everyone to please keep yourselves muted during the workshop and to type your questions into the chat box throughout the discussion. And we'll read out your questions when we get to the Q&A portion of the session. Liz also has uh, pre-prepared some resources for us that we have linked to the workshop's link page at the bottom. I'll pop that into the chat. So those are downloads you can access at any time or later. I also wanted to note that we are recording this meeting uh, and all the workshop sessions, which will become available to you after the conference. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Liz Henderson, farmer, author, and board member of the Agricultural Justice Project. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. Um, I've been a uh, farmer for many years. I'm retired now. My farm was one of the first community supported agriculture farms in the country and second or third in New York State. We argue about who was the second. Um, in addition to farming, I've spent 30 years or so as an active member of NOFA and I co-chair the policy committee in New York State and on the interstate level and I'm NOFA's representative to the board of the Agricultural Justice Project. What I'd like to do now is to um, give a short acknowledgement. I am living on ancestral and treaty lands of the Haudenosaunee Seneca people. This land has shown us the gift of community, connection, and reverence, and I hope to continue seeking the guidance from the elders and land keepers who've been nurturing the biodiversity of this region for countless generations. What I'd like to do now is to find out who you are. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions and maybe you can raise your hands um, to let us know. So, who of you is a farmer? You can either actually show your face and raise your hand, or there's a little, you know, a reaction, a raised hand thing. Do you own your own farm? Are you farming on somebody else's land? Are you a farm manager? How many of you are working on a farm, but not the manager? Okay, well, it looks like most of you are not farmers. So are you researchers or teachers, educators? Okay. Um, couple of those. Other, what, what kind of others are you? Maybe you could put that in the chat because I'd love to know who I'm talking to here. Homesteader, okay, great. Well, a CSA manager. In between farms as a homesteader educator. A wine grower, okay. A commercial farm, oh, okay. Brand new farmers, exciting. And a farm worker who just came late, that's all right. <laughs> um, and gardeners. How many gardeners do we have here? Okay, a bunch of gardeners, wonderful. Well, in the, in the United States, 
we still have some democracy in public governance, but we have very little democracy in most workplaces. In 49 of the 50 states, at will law prevails, and that gives the employer the right to fire without cause. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, on at will law. If the employee can prove that it was discrimination for race, ethnicity, age, or, or illness. But the exceptions to at will enterprises are cooperatives where people are sharing a set of uh, agreements on how they're going to work together or unionized workplaces. For farms, there have been major problems over the years of justice for farmers and justice for farm workers. So a number of different approaches have been taken to correct for that. For farmers, the organic premium addresses that, getting a somewhat fairer price for people who run farms. Community supported agriculture gives a farmer the opportunity to actually negotiate a fairer deal with the people who become the shareholders in your farm. Farmer cooperatives, and there's a very new project from disparity to parity that you might all want to check out, which is working to return parity and supply management which was the basic underlying policy in the United States that was implemented as part of the New Deal. And it meant that farmers were paid prices that actually covered their costs of production in exchange for agreeing to limiting the supply of how much they grew and implementing conservation practices. So that was how farming in the United States came out of the depression and how we ended the Dust Bowl. But that was ended in, well, after World War II, gradually from the 50s and most completely in the 1996 Farm Bill, which ended the last remnants of parity payments. For farm workers, ways of addressing injustice have been through unionization the United Farm Workers. They've been working for decades in California to unionize farm workers. But I have to tell you, it has been an uphill battle. After all these years, less than 2% of the farm workers in California are unionized. Another approach has been that taken by the Immokalee Farm Workers, where they embarrassed the brand. And then the brand says, all right, I'll pay that extra penny a pound for the tomatoes, but the farms who supply my brand have to sign on to a contract with the Immokalee farm workers and the farmers then sign that contract, which requires that they meet certain conditions that the farm workers have, uh, are requiring of them. And up in our region, uh, migrant justice has been using that approach very effectively with um, Ben and Jerry's. And now they are trying to get um, Hanover's to do the same thing. <clears throat> the other approach that the United Farm Workers have taken is the Equitable Food Initiative, where um, United Farm Workers have partnered with Costco and a few other big brands and with the Pesticide Action Network to um, get the Costco to pay for some training for some of the farm workers so that they will work in a management committee, giving those farm workers some more say over the conditions of work and in exchange, what Costco gets is a very high commitment to food safety on those farms. 
final approach that's been tried is the one that we've tried in the Agricultural Justice Project that we felt was more appropriate for organic farms where so many of the farmers already have a commitment to food justice and to um, social justice to have a, a voluntary um, certification program. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. But I'd like to hear from you yourselves about what you think a farm or food just food business of any kind would have to have in place in, in the way of policies in order to make a public claim of fairness. So if you would write your ideas in the chat, just take a couple of minutes. What does a farm need to have? An example would be paying living wages. What are some other ideas? What are your ideas about that? Healthcare coverage, set hours with time off. Get some more ideas coming. Come on, get your get your juices flowing. What else? Safe and adequate housing for employees who live on the farm. Balance of stakeholder interests, owner, worker, customer, um, investors, safe work environment livable wages, health care, would be dreamy, um, hours that are balanced, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee, an ongoing learning and participation for all members of the organization or farm, decent housing, manageable work hours, share in the food being produced, a safe forum for feedback, that's a really good one, Healthcare shouldn't have to be tied to your job anyway, but yes. Very nice. Child care, a year-round position, workers' comp, housing for interns, a defiantly fair wage of $20 an hour. All right, how about that for the farmer as well as the farm workers? Insurance coverage. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now and talk to you about the Agricultural Justice Project. Because really that is exactly what we did. We started, we started by generating a list very much like the one that we just all did together back in 1999 when we realized that the National Organic Program was not going to include fair prices for farmers or fair conditions for farm workers in the National Organic Program. So we started the Agricultural Justice Project with the modest um, ambition to transform the existing agriculture and food system into one based on empowerment, justice, and fairness for all who labor from farm to retail. So it may take us a few more years to get there, but with your help, I think we can do it. So our underlying principles are equality in power, governance and decision-making. We've worked very hard to involve all the stakeholders in the development of, our, of the program and in the development of our standards so that what we come out with is fair for all, not just for a few people. And that's mean, that has meant that our process has been slow because when you make sure that everybody is involved and that you get their opinions and hear their ideas, it means a somewhat cumbersome process, but it's worth the effort because what you come out with is really much stronger and a higher bar. 
as we would like to see farms and food businesses where everybody shares in the protection of, of our earth together, working and sharing our ideas. So the standards for farm workers include health and safety, a fair, safe place where they are trained to make sure that they are safe and where they also know what their legal rights are. Where there's freedom of association, negotiation of conditions, not just take it or leave it. Where no one can be fired without just cause. Where the terms of employment are clear and written in a language that people understand. Whereas people wrote into the chat, if there's housing, that it's clean and safe and decent where everybody's paid a living wage and where there is conflict resolution with no retaliation for raising issues. So you can be, you know, a whistleblower and see something that's a problem and raise it and not worry about being fired for doing that. And the standards that we've created for AJP are parallel between farmers, other food system workers, and the farmers. So farmers are also entitled to fair contracts with the people who buy from them, with prices that cover their costs of production, prices that include living wages for the farmers, as well as the people who work on their farm. The farmers are paid on time, where the farmers have freedom of association and conflict resolution with no retaliation for raising issues. If any of you have been following what happens to the farmers who raise chickens for outlets like Tyson, you know that the contracts that they get are nothing like what I'm talking about here. So as I talk about some of the resources that um, are involved in the, the food justice standards, I welcome you to write into the chat your email and a list of anything that you would like, either for your farm, or if you're a farm worker, or if you're a student of this and would just like some of these resources, if you give me your email in the next few days, I will send you those pieces. For example, a conflict resolution policy that you can use. And now I'm going to talk about a bit more about some of the standards that may be needing some clarity to, so that everybody understands what we're talking about. But before I get to that, I want to mention something that's really important for any certification program. It is only as good as the verification system. The problems that we've been having in organic agriculture are not due to the standards themselves being weakened. No one's changed those standards. The problem is with the verification and accreditation system. So for food justice certification, any farm or food business is inspected by a team of two. One person is a trained person from a certification agency who meets with the owner or the manager and reviews the files to make sure that that farm has decent employment uh, guidelines or a handbook, um, has safety training and records of who is trained, things like that. And also a person from a farm worker or worker organization who's been trained to do this inspection who will interview the employees separate from management individually and in confidence so that that person feels free to talk about what's really going on at that farm or food business. The accreditation system that we have is rather simple because it's a small program. The accreditation of the National Organic Program is where the problems lie. 
that the National Organic Program has accredited and allowed to continue work by certifiers who are not actually meeting the standards or not requiring that the food farms and food businesses that they are certifying really meet the standards. It, there should be no problem about a standard, a very simple standard like animals have access to pasture. That's, that's a simple statement. That means that the animal goes out and chews with its own mouth. We shouldn't have had to have a pasture, special pasture, um, extra regulations and stuff like that. But anyway, to get back to food justice certification and some of our trickier standards. Freedom of association for food justice does not mean that the farm has to be unionized. It does mean that everybody who works on the farm feels, feels free to talk to the manager or the owner and negotiate about the conditions of work to elect someone to represent them, to communicate with the employer or to talk to unions or to even choose to unionize. But unionization is not required. It's just the freedom to talk about the conditions of work and the wages so that it's not a take it or leave it kind of situation. Every food business or farm or not-for-profit organization or even marriage really needs to have a conflict resolution process that everybody agrees with. There's always going to be conflict between men and women, between non-binary people, adults and children, employees and uh, their employers. There's going to be conflict. And the difference is facing that conflict squarely and trying to understand why it's happening and how you can resolve it to everybody's satisfaction and having a process that you agree to so that you can deal with that. So AJP strongly recommends that you have a conflict resolution process and we can give you a sample that you can use and adapt. You can study nonviolent conflict resolution. You can study restorative justice and use that. There are some farms that are using some really um, very creative ways of dealing with conflict by having real talk where once a month or so, everybody goes around the circle and says to, has a chance to say to everybody else who's working there, You've been doing this that's really wonderful, but I have a problem with you doing that. So that people are constantly working on their communications and making them better. So food justice certification doesn't dictate what process you use, but we do insist that you have a process. Living wages. There is no one set living wage across the whole country that can apply. Every area has a different standard of living. Believe me, in Wayne County, New York, it's a lot cheaper to live than in New York City or in Boston or wherever. And there are many localities that have developed living wage calculators so you can figure out how much housing costs, food, health care, the needs of your family, and a small amount for savings, a living wage that's appropriate to wherever it is you are. And food justice certification does not require that you already are paying a living wage. But if you're not paying a living wage, that you, that the manager and the people who work there are working together to see how you can get to the point where everybody can be paid a living wage, that you figure out a process so that the farm will share 
the basic financials of the farm. Not all the detailed personal financials of the farmer, but the basic revenues and expenses of the farm so that you can all work together to improve the bottom line and everybody can be paid better. So if this is something that you need some resources on, please put your name and email on the chat and I will send it. The right to full disclosure. Everybody is entitled to knowing what the deal is, um, what the policies are, what the disciplinary policy are, what the things are that if you do, you will be fired immediately. So if the farm has zero tolerance for drugs in alcohol, for violence, for carrying a weapon, if you're caught doing any of those things, you're out of there immediately. Or if it's a disciplinary process whereby you get a warning, you get warning number two, you get warning number three, and then you consider suspension or firing, what that process is. And there should be a file on every employee that the employees have access to, that they can ask to see. And there should be information available to everybody on any hazardous or toxic substances that are being used or stored on the farm. It's safer for the farm that everybody knows about that. Maybe the farm owner will be gone when a, there's a fire and something catches on fire. The employees will know where to tell the, um, you know, the, the, the fire brigade that comes where things are. Everybody should have regular performance reviews. It could be twice a year, it could be more frequent, it, and it should be two-way. It's an opportunity for the manager or the farm owner to say, I would like to see you improve in this and this and that way. I would like to know from you what the things are that you want to learn so that we can set up your working conditions so that that's possible. Um, I would like to know from you how you think I've been doing as your manager. A chance for an employee to say, you know, I, I really like working here, but when you talk to me in that tone of voice, you make me feel very bad. And I would be a better employee if you would not do that, if you would treat me more respectfully. And that way, you, everybody improves. And it gets to be a better workplace for everybody. Termination. At will, as I mentioned, <clears throat> gives our managers the freedom to just fire people. You wear pur purple too often and it irritates me. You're out of here. But if you want food justice certification, you can only terminate people for a just cause. And you need to document that. We've warned you, I've warned you again, you did it again, I hate it. Now I'm gonna fire you and I have a dossier that shows why. Um, as an employer, it actually, is safer for you because if somebody sues you for firing them unjustly, you have the proof. You can show, I required these things and this person repeatedly did whatever it is that they did that led me to fire them. And then um, you cannot be sued for um, unjust firing. So AGP also asks for other benefits. Definitely a day off every seven days. It doesn't have to be a particular day. Um, workers' compensation, unemployment, that you pay Social Security, that there be a sick leave. Um, 
for every 30 hours that people work, they should get one hour off. So that accumulates and gets to be a decent amount of paid leave. And then maternity and paternity leave, at least unpaid. Health and safety is extremely important. It is your um, responsibility if you're running a farm to maintain a safe place. There is an incredible resource in our region, the New York Center for Agriculture, Agricultural Medicine and Health, NICAM. Their website has resources on every possible hazard that could ever you imagine existing on a farm. You can go to that resource and get information in English and in Spanish. That way you can do trainings and you can have a really good safety plan for your farm and train people in how to be safe and involve people in recognizing um, hazards on your farm. There are things that you might not see, but that someone working on your farm will notice. And there should be regular breaks and regular discussions about health and safety. Things should be designed in such a way that they're ergonomically sound. And my farm partner and I had two different sinks. There was one a foot higher for him and lower for me. And that way, both of us were comfortable washing the vegetables. Setting things up in the right way can make all the difference between it being comfortable or uncomfortable backbreaking. And the final thing I really want to mention is for interns, food justice certification considers it unacceptable to have interns who are not paid. You have to pay them at least minimum hourly wage. But if they are working at you for you for minimum wage, less than a living wage, they deserve to really get the training and the learning that they came there to get. So you should write a learning contract with them and document the learning that they are getting. Check in with them to make sure that they are getting what, they're, what they wanted to learn. And if you don't have that on your farm, pay for them to go to a NOFA conference a field day, let them spend a few days on somebody else's farm where they can learn that skill. And that way the internship becomes a fair deal for everybody. Um, we also have standards of fair dealings between businesses, which are parallel to those other standards and standards for not-for-profits. So if your farm or food business is run by a board, that board should be democratically selected. And there should be at least a few people on that board who understand about farming or the food business so that the things that they ask of the farm are reasonable. I did one job as a... Um, a contractor to give advice to a farm. And I never did it again because it was such a lousy experience. The board did not have anybody on the board who had experienced farming. So they were making demands of that farm that weren't reasonable. And there was one person on the board who really wanted to get the farmer job for their son. So there were all kinds of nasty things going on behind the scenes that were not acceptable. I wrote a report, they took it, they paid me, but they never used any of my advice. <laughs> so I'll never be a consultant again. But anyway, not-for-profits also need to have conflict resolution. So those are the things that I wanted to share with you about food justice certification. And I will stop sharing my screen and now I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Thank you, Liz. Um, I am going to put the link in the chat again to the resources that you provided that are on our website. So for people who came in after I shared that earlier, those are at the bottom of the page I just put in the chat. And there's four PDFs, uh, Food Justice Certification on Farms, the conflict, conflict Resolution Process, Farmer Rights, and Labor Rights for Farm Workers. I also want to mention that um, AJP has a model employee handbook that is based on our standards. So it's like a whole set of employee guidelines. So if you would like a copy of that, I'm also happy to provide that to you. There is one condition though, that you tell me whether you find it useful and you promise that you will help me make it better if you see anything wrong with it or any way of making it better, anything that should be written more clearly. So write your name and email on the chat if that's something that you would like. Great. Um, Liz, I can help you with the questions here. So we have a question from Willa who has asked, who is eligible for food justice certification? Any farm can apply or any kind of food business. So it could be a restaurant, a food co-op, a store, a food processor. For farms, we ask that you either be certified organic, biodynamic, certified naturally grown, or if you are self-declared organic or certified naturally grown, we will ask you to fill out the section of the organic certification application where you list substances that you use. There's a very strong demand from the farm worker stakeholders who participated in creating the food justice standards is that they not be exposed to toxic materials without proper protection and without knowing fully what it is. So if you want to um, qualify for food justice certification, we want to know from you what you're using and that you're using the least toxic materials that you can. Okay, other questions? Great, um, let's see here. We have a comment from Julie. It would be great if there was government financial support to help farms transi transition to these standards and healthcare for all farm workers and subsidize to ensure that a living wage is paid. That doesn't exist, but what um, the board of AGP has been working on lately is raising enough money so that the farms that need it can apply to us and we can pay for all or most of the costs of the certification. So we have managed to raise about um, $15,000 so far. 10 of that is a really wonderful contribution for, from the National Cooperative Grocers. And they have earmarked that for farms that are owned or managed by BIPOC farmers. So if you are a BIPOC farmer, we can cover your certification fee for free for sure. Um, we are still trying to raise more money so that it will cover the costs of non-BIPOC farmers. We think white farmers should also be able to get food justice certification for free and we're working on it. So if you happen to have a chunk of money that you want to give to a good cause, that fundraiser is ongoing and we would be very grateful to accept any amount that you have. Thank you. We have another question from Becky. Is there an aspect of consumer education on this? Of course. And um, our, 
the Agricultural Justice Project has a communications project that we call Whose Voice is Missing? We ask that question over and over again because the voices of so many of the people who work in the food system have been missing. And we have a whole series of really fine um, social media um, short videos and photos with quotes from farm workers, low-income people, farmers who have had various struggles. And that series is available either on the Agricultural Justice Project website or we have a special Whose Voice is Missing website and Facebook page where you can get a hold and borrow, share, reuse all of those materials that help educate people about the ongoing injustices in the food system and also the good things that people are doing to um, overcome those. And I would say an awful lot of the social media that NOFA New Hampshire and all the NOFA chapters do contributes to uh, that education of uh, customers and eaters in how to eat in ways that are more just and climate friendly. This is the 50th anniversary of NOFA this year. We've been going for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> and over those 50 years, the NOFAs have really created um, a market for organic farms that didn't exist 50 years ago. There are so many more people who understand the value of buying from local farms, eating local organic food. And of course, that's a really big part of educating consumers. Does that answer your question? Good, okay. That's great. And then we have another question, Liz, from Emma, who asks, are you recertified annually? Yes. It's an annual process. However, if a farm is doing, has been inspected twice and then does a really good job, we give you a year off from inspection. You just have to, you know, do renew the form. So you get a buy year for good, good behavior. We're trying to make it um, as uncumbersome as we can and yet credible. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Ellen who says, New Hampshire is a notorious right to work state, workers comp, routinely denied and fought against in the state, um, knowing from personal experience, uh, this person has said, and um, the excuse not to cover their injury as a seasonal part-time employee. Um, most farm workers are at least seasonal, some part-time as well. How does this play out in a state like New Hampshire where the historic culture is minimal rights for workers and anti-union? Um, and then there's another, I think, another part of the question at the same time. At the same time, how do we broach that kind of a culture and mindset when implementing these ideals, especially a living wage? Well, those are, I mean, that's, that's really why this project exists. Because there has been so much injustice to farm workers, most particularly, who are mainly people of color across the country and across the country over half of all of the farm workers are undocumented people of color that's probably less true on the farms no the organic farms that are certified by the by the nofas or by the state of new hampshire from the surveying that um, 
NOFA and the Agricultural Justice Project have done of NOFA farmers. Most of the work is done by the farm families themselves with only a few employees. And it's a fairly small percentage of the organic farms who are using HBA workers or migrant workers. And nevertheless, we live in you know, an overall environment where the conditions that you described, Ellen, are those pre the prevailing conditions. And I think particularly in this moment when COVID has exposed so, so much more vividly to people the injustices that are going on, that farms that can make the claim that they are working towards living wages and treating their workers with respect and using food justice standards would attract customers who care about them. I can't promise you how many people that is. Um, when Consumer Union, Consumer Reports um, does their surveys, it's something like 20% of people say that they really care about it. Whether they would actually pay more for that, we don't know. Pie Ranch, which is out in California, which has been food justice certified since um, 2013, they have been doing an experiment in their store. They have a store that's right on Route 1. And they asked customers to pay a voluntary two and a half percent food justice tax on whatever they buy. And they explain, you know, they have a little thing that explains that that money goes towards paying for their food justice certification. And most of the people who shop there are willing to pay that. But of course, you know, that's route one, it's a really classy amazing place to be farming. Nevertheless, you know, there are some people who care enough to do that. And NOFA together, all the NOFA chapters together with EJP have been doing a project fair from farm to retail over the past few years, where we've been reaching out to food co-ops to see if they are willing to work with the farmers that supply them to work together to promote the idea that both the co-op and the farms have better working conditions. And we've just really gotten started on that. We haven't had the resources to develop it as much as we would like to. We hope to be able um, in the future to do that. Uh, we have figured out a kind of a, a survey that a produce manager at a food co-op can work through to help them think through buying more from area farms that are certified organic or farms that have better working conditions. So that's kind of in our in our to do um, box that we've just gotten gotten started on. Thank you. Um, I have a question. How long does it take or can it take to become certified? Well, um, the certifier that does this is the Ohio Ecological Food and Farming Association. They're based in Ohio. They just took this over two years ago and their staff is getting up to speed. They are ready to send out applications to any farm that wants them um, in the next couple of weeks. And then, it, however long it takes the farm to fill out that application, it probably would take a couple of hours the first year to fill out the application. And the farm has to provide um, OFA with the necessary documentation. So if you have a written handbook, you have a safety plan, you can supply that. They can look it over and see that you've got what's needed. If you don't 
have that. You can turn to me and AJP and we will provide you with a model handbook that you can adopt. And when you have it ready and you and your staff are trained to it, then you can send that to OFA. So really how long it takes depends on how prepared your farm and food business is. And that fair from farm to retail project really was working with farms to get them ready. So there are 10 farms that worked with us very closely on that project and are ready to be certified. So we hope that there will be a bunch in the land that will be certified over this next year. Partly it depends on how soon we can actually do in-person inspections. Does that answer your question? Yes, Good. thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And then we have another question from Nadine. Are there any food justice networks internationally that you admire? Uh, well, let's see. When we started this project um, and wrote the first draft of the standards, we took those standards to an IFOM, International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, um, Organic World Congress. And we had a pre-Congress day, half a day um, meeting to which we invited people from all over the world who were engaged in organic and fair trade. And the ticket of entry was people would read our first draft and give us comments. When we held that meeting, we were just really amazed that 50 people from 40 different um, programs and mainly different countries showed up. So just going around the circle blew our agenda finding out all of the things that people were doing in different countries around the world. So there are many amazing organic fair trade programs that are in existence. Uh, a few that I could mention, um, Naturland in Germany, some of you, if you did the real organic program um, series, you heard from um, uh, a young woman who spoke on behalf of Naturland. That is an amazing organization that I think could be a model for the NOFAs and any of organic farming organizations because they not only have certification, they have farmer training, they do marketing, and they have a fair trade component that um, farms and food businesses can sign up for. In Thailand, when, when we blew our agenda on that first meeting that I mentioned to you, um, an organization in Thailand invited us to come there to an iPhone um, trade conference that was going to happen the next year. Um, Green, Green Net, and they were our host. So check out Green Net. It is an organic fair trade organization that has helped many farms transition to organic. And the requirement that Green Net has is that the farm, first of all, grow enough food for the family. Only then can they also produce some products for sale through the Green Net um, stores in Thailand and for shipment abroad? It's really a remarkable program. There are others, but there's um, quite a lot that's going on um, in other parts of the world. That's very impressive, from which I have 
all of us in the Agricultural Justice Project have been able to learn a tremendous amount. The United States actually is way behind some other countries. We have only signed on to a few of the ILO, the International Labor Organization um, conventions. We are not signed on to um, other international conventions that require better treatment of farm workers and fairness to farmers. Our labor standards are way below the standards of the European Union and enforcement is weaker. Liz, we have another question here um, from David who asks, is there a relationship between farm size and implementation of our concerns from local family to big industrial farms? Well, the farms that have been doing food justice certification are mid to small farms. The mid-sized farms are probably have more resources for doing an additional certification, but we created our standards to cover any size farm. We have not been able to find a really big farm that is interested in our certification. We have done pre-certification pre assessments on a couple of the very largest organic vegetable farms in the country that have chosen not to go all the way through the certification because they're actually hiring some undocumented workers and they don't want to call attention to that. So they've used our standards to improve their policies without trying to make a public claim in the marketplace. And as a result of that, I have had the honor of seeing a few of the most amazing farms. Thank you. I see in the chat that a right to work bill just mm -hmm. passed the Senate. Does it have to pass both houses? Do you have two houses? So you still have a chance to stop it? No, it's... Whew. Well, maybe the Biden administration, maybe on the federal level, they'll pass the PRO Act, which makes it easier for workers to unionize. And we'll see what happens. But your state can have whatever laws it wants. If you want to be food justice certified, you can't use those low, miserable standards. You have to treat people with respect and treat them fairly. And if we could get some buyers to certify, and believe me, we have been trying for 20 years. With co-ops with some of the big organic brands to get a commitment to only buy from food justice certified farms. We have not been successful. We have used up a lot of time and energy with some of the biggest organic brands. There's very little market pull for better working conditions on farms and food businesses. That's the reality. But joining us is blazing a trail towards the kind of food system I think we all really want. I think probably all of you would agree with me that working on an organic farm should be a wonderful job that pays the farmer and pays the people who work there well. It's beautiful work and should be remunerated properly. 
I mean, I don't think we can talk about having a sustainable agriculture until there are agriculture is worth sustaining by having good conditions for the people who are involved. And that's what the four principles of organic agriculture of IFOM are about. And that's what that handout on farmer rights refers to. We as farmers have rights that aren't upheld in the marketplace either. Liz, thank you so much. I'm going to put um, some links into the chat. We're almost at 1230. And I'm going to share one more screen. I did collect some email addresses for you that people sent um, privately, and I will send those to you. So um, everyone who sent that, Liz will get your email addresses and she'll send you the materials that you requested. Great, thank you so much. And thank yes. you, Nikki. I hope, I hope that met your expectations. So thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Um, so Liz, I want to thank you again for sharing all your knowledge with us and everyone for asking all of your great questions. Uh, the links I put in the chat are also up here on the shared screen. And as Liz mentioned, NOFA is really excited to be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And if you're not already, we'd love for you to join our growing community by becoming a member in 2020. And we do have scholarship memberships, so cost doesn't need to be a barrier. Um, please contact us for more information. And please also check out our virtual exhibitor fair, which includes a book list hosted by Main Street Bookends, where you can get copies of the books by our author speakers and others, including Liz. Um, there's a book by Liz on that list. And 20% of proceeds go back to support NOFA New Hampshire throughout the year. So you can purchase books at any time, not just this weekend. And please do grab your lunch and hop on over to our annual meeting, which is happening next. And we'll be giving away some raffle prizes at that meeting. You do need to be present to win some uh, four different books. To that session is in the chat as well. So thank you again, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Liz.